Okay, I think we can get started. Good morning, thank you everyone for coming to our May Nuance Tech Talk um, with Paul Smeets. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we're making sure to leave time at the end of the talk to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Katie. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm delighted to be giving this presentation today as part of the uh, Nuance Tech Talk series. So my name is uh, Paul Smeets. I'm a research associate here in the EPIC facility of Nuance, and I manage, uh, amongst others, our Focus Ion Beam systems and our Joel ARM 300F uh, TEM. So a significant amount of cutting edge transmission line electron microscopy or TEM data or STEM scanning transmission electron microscopy data uh, that's, for example, shown here on the right hand of this slide, is produced using state-of-the-art multi-million dollar microscopes, as you can see here in the center, that come in all different sizes and shapes. And in fact, more modern TMs are actually losing shape because they come more and more in these large boxes for, for beam stability purposes. But nevertheless, uh, of course, a a uh, great microscopist is needed to get to these results, but what you hear um, much less often about is really the sample preparation process. So for uh, on, on the left hand side here, I showed uh, the interactions of uh, a primary beam shown in green with a thin TEM specimen. So the majority of the electrons uh, needs to be transmitted uh, through the sample. Uh, Whereas if you have a, a thicker sample, uh, your, your the probability of electron scattering uh, will, will, will increase and multiple scattering effects can take place. Uh, and uh, of course the electron mean free path um, gets, gets, uh, gets altered, um, depending of course on, on conditions like what accelerating voltage you're using and so on and so forth. So we need a sufficiently thin uh, TEM sample in order to get the data as well. So um, I've kind of summarized here five requirements. What really makes a good high quality TEM sample? So uh, the first requirement, it, it really needs to be uh, geometrically fitting into holders that then typically are entered through the site into the, the, the TEM instrument. So, uh, an area um, uh, should take up smaller or equal to three millimeter to fit into uh, various TEM holders. Um, the second requirement is it needs to be very thin as I kind of addressed already and kind of a ballpark um, number that you should keep into mind is about 100 nanometers uh, or less. Another requirement is that you need to have a, a, a large flat electron transparent region so you don't want a large roughness variations uh, on the nanometer, even through the micron scale um, uh, to, to use for, for characterization. Um, fourth requirement is there should be no additional uh, artifacts. Uh, for example, if you do a synthesis, you want to make sure you have like clean glassware so that you don't introduce any um, uh, elements that are not native to your sample. And the fifth requirement, it, it uh, and that's that's sometimes a tricky one is that it should not contaminate in the TEM. So if you have a, a sample with a lot of organics absorbed onto it, you can clearly see that back where you have carbon contamination. And I actually gave a tech talk uh, about that, uh, uh, I think it was a year and a half ago or so. Um, so uh, basically the, this workflow that I showed here is, is as good as your weakest link. So if you start with a bad sample, guaranteed you will get a bad, a bad, a bad data out. So that's a, this garbage in, garbage out kind of scheme that I put here. Now, what can we make TEM samples of? Well, the answer is already displayed on the, on the slide. In principle, everything in a solid state we can prepare as a TEM sample. And uh, I've kind of uh, gone over different classifications here. So if we have a bulk sample, there's various ways we can prepare a TM sample from a bulk sample. Um, for example, it can be uh, done uh, by a combination of the instruments here shown on the, on the, on the, on the top row. Uh, you can cut it using a diamond saw, so a very sturdy saw to, to cut it into uh, 
shape, you can uh, then, uh, for example, grind your sample to 100, to, uh, 100 microns in thickness using uh, silicon carbide uh, grinding paper with different uh, roughnesses. Uh, punch uh, a disc, so the three millimeter disc kind of requirement as I, I, I talked about before. Um, use uh, a dimple grinder to create a, a small dimple, like a, basically a pit into, into that three millimeter grid. And then uh, use something like a, a broad beam argon uh, uh, ion beam milling to, to mill this sample to, to electron transparency. Um, alternatively, you can potentially crush your sample di directly into a powder and then disperse it into like a low vapor pressure solvent, typically something like an alcohol, and then transfer it to a TM grid. Uh, you can electrochemically polish if you have an electrically conducting material, or you can perform a FIPS and And um, I will definitely talk about that later. Um, for a thin film, so if you have a thin film with a region of interest, what you can do is you can make it bulk like by, for example, gluing it uh, in between uh, two silicon wafers with a very thin, accurate glue line, and then uh, mechanically thin it in the desired orientation, uh, often followed by uh, uh, IMB milling to, to get to electric transparency. Or alternatively, you can perform a FIPS and lift out. Um, then a third classification, if you have powders, nanoparticles, or fibers, you can again just disperse them on a on a grid directly or via the, the, the solvent method that I that I talked about. Uh, you can compress them, uh, embed them in epoxy. Uh, so basically, follow the the bulk workflow again, or microtone them. So it's kind of if you have like imagine you have like a, your sample is like a salami. You can just cut very thin uh, slices using a, a diamond knife with a, with a microtome as well that are already sufficiently thin that you can image uh, or characterize uh, your sample in the, in the TEM. Or um, you can perform, uh, in certain cases, a FIPS and lift out. And as you can see here, FIPS and really appears uh, a power, powerful tool in the grand scheme of successful uh, TEM sample preparation. So now before I go into that specific uh, uh, TM sample preparation. There's two uh, FIPSAMs here that we have uh, at Nuance. We have uh, Helios Nanolab from Thermo Fisher and uh, 4700F um, from Joel. That, as you can see here, I have a really a myriad of, of capabilities. So I'm, I always compare these systems like with a Swiss Army knife. Um, uh, because uh, the, they, uh, they can do so many things. Um, but about 80 to 90% of our users actually use our FIPSAMs to do sample preparation, and specifically TEM sample preparation and Adam Probe sample preparation. But of course, today I will focus on the TEM sample preparation part. Before I do that, I, I really just like to, to, to uh, go over some fundamentals of uh, FIPSAM dual beam. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, the focused ion beam can come uh, in, in, in various, uh, various uh, first of all, various elements that uh, ions that can be accelerated towards a sample, but also a different type of, of sources. So, um, uh, in the top left here, you can see uh, basically the, the uh, periodic system where uh, we see that uh, there's plasma sources, uh, oxygen, argon, xenon, that really have kind of come about in the last decades or so. Um, and, but the most popular one is, is a liquid metal and alloy ion source, and specifically a gallium source. And uh, so, why, why gallium? Well, I kind of listed the, the advantages that gallium has over here. So it uh, has good emission characteristics like a high brightness and low energy spread. It's vacuum compatible, has a low melting point and vapor pressure and comes out as one single uh, species. But perhaps the largest advantage that gallium has is when it is heated up to just about <coughs> room temperature. 
and it's it's uh, basically on this on, on this tungsten needle. Here's uh, on the left uh, an image of the the photograph of the actual uh, tungsten tip over here. <clears throat> uh, when it's heated up to about room temperature, it can form this so-called Taylor cone, uh, and that is basically the creation of a virtual source that is about 10 to 15 nanometers in diameter. And when this is submitted to an electric field, uh, positively charged gallium ions are then uh, emitted uh, towards the sample and accelerated typically from one to 30 kV. Now these um, gallium ions are focused by electrostatic lenses, so not electromagnetic lenses as in an SEM, uh, and then they can uh, interact with your sample. <clears throat> Um, so just briefly, how do you form an image in the SEM and the FIB? So for SEM, I think most of you are familiar where you have a beam of electrons that are formed by electromagnetic lenses that are then electro, um, uh, that are then um, accelerated uh, towards the sample. Um, and this beam interacts uh, with, with the sample and creates secondary electrons. And these secondary electrons are then um, uh, going towards the secondary electron detector. Um, the amount that is collected is basically assigned uh, a gray level from black to white, uh, so as, as shown here. And that will then form one pixel in your image. And so then the beam is moved over one increment and, and a 2D image uh, basically is formed. Now, imagine we just Add another beam to that, in this case, a focus ion beam. So with a specific orientation with respect to the electron beam. So in our case, we have a 52 or 53 degree uh, angle difference between these. So uh, then we can tilt our stage perpendicular to the, the ion beam. And this, the, the gallium ions interact with our sample, but also create secondary electrons. And so basically the same um, uh, imaging process for the SEM can then be repeated just for the FIB. So that's how you form an FIB image. However, gallium ions can do something that electrons cannot do. And for that, I've kind of created this analogy here. I'm a relatively large soccer fan. So I like to illustrate that uh, with these um, glued together uh, soccer balls that basically are, are uh, in a close packed arrangement onto uh, uh, a wall. So imagine that the glue is, is strong, flexible, but not permanent. So then I will color several layers uh, just for, for ease uh, the, to, to, to see this. Uh, so much like an, an, uh, uh, an atomic structure of, of, uh, of a crystalline material. So what now happens if I shoot the ball at the wall? Well, the damage that uh, is created there will definitely uh, supersede the, the diameter of one soccer ball and will go on for several layers. Um, so that is basically what an ion does to the surface at the atomic scale. And that process is called sputtering or also called milling. Now imagine somebody else does that, a professional soccer player who do this. Well, then the crater much like a shock wave will be much larger and will, uh, will exceed that diameter uh, and will even penetrate uh, deeper layers into this as well. So that I also shown here with actual simulations of a, uh, a gallium beam that's accelerated at different accelerating voltages. So imagine the, uh, the, the 10 kV situation would be me hitting the soccer ball into the wall. Then you can see that Gallium in, this is in, uh, in 100 nanometers of silicon, will penetrate about 30 nanometers. Versus if that professional soccer player would do that, it's, it's deeper, it's about uh, 60 nanometers. So what is then a low voltage situation? Well, that would basically be something like my seven month old daughter hitting a soccer ball into that wall and the penetration is very minimal. Now, uh, what is the effect then of influence, the influence of alternating, alternating the current? So here is the simulations that correspond to that. So that would be an analogous situation of multiple professional soccer players or multiple knees or multiple babies hitting that soccer ball into the wall. 
Um, so why can't electrons sputter atoms? Well, the key really lies in the word momentum there. So gallium is much heavier. So I've uh, shown here the mass ratio uh, and is much, much larger than an electron. If you would imagine a gallium ion like a tennis ball, then uh, an electron is something like a buckyball. So like one nanometer, so a huge size difference. So what this means is that uh, if you have a 30 kV gallium beam that's penetrating your sample, which is about 60 nanometer, um, because they are so large, these ions, they lose a lot of momentum when they hit your sample. So the, 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 the penetration depth is basically equal to about two or three kV uh, electrons um, from an electron beam penetrating. Um, a nice analogy, again, for, for looking at the momentum difference between electrons and ions is imagine you're driving on the highway uh, and there is a fly that hits your windshield. That's basically comparable to an electron. So what would the situation be where a gallium ion is then um, hitting the windshield? Well, it turns out that would be the weight of something like a train. Um, so... <laughs> Um, so if you have uh, gallium interacting with your sample, there, there's multiple um, um, events that can occur. And that's shown here on the, the right side, uh, side of, the, of, the, of the slide. Um, there's one situation I didn't uh, discuss here. That is, for example, um, uh, a gallium ion doesn't have to interact directly with your sample. It can also be uh, what's called back sputtered. So that's basically comparable to a backscattered electron on uh, in uh, in the, in the electron beam interaction with your sample. Uh, but if it does interact, it can uh, uh, do a couple of things. First of all, it can knock an atom out of place, and then the gallium can cascade further and be implanted in your sample. Uh, but alternatively, uh, this this knocked out atom in your, in your, in your lattice can uh, cascade further, uh, create an interstitial atom, and the other um, atom that's uh, uh, moved out of place is then sputtered directly from the sample surface, and with that process releases either x-rays or secondary electrons uh, uh, near the surface. Now, the tip uh, sample interaction is uh, strongly material dependent and does not um, depend much on, a, not, not a there's not a direct correlation with atomic number. Uh, for example, this is a, uh, these are simulations done where um, um, 30 kV gallium ion beam is um, uh, targeted onto a 100 nanometer uh, thick sample, silicon, magnesium, uh, carbon, uh, Etc. Um, now the atomic number of gold is 79, uh, and the atomic number of, for example, nickel is 20. Sorry, nickel is yes, 28. So there's a, a very large difference, and uh, uh, the penetration depth is is more or less the same. So it, it really depends on on material properties such as density and, and melting temperature. Um, I don't, I don't want to go too much into details in, in equations and things like that here. Um, now, the interaction depth of the gallium ion beam can be controlled. Um, so you can control it with uh, accelerating voltage and the angle of the uh, gallium beam that is your sample. So uh, as you can see from this, this graph on the left-hand side, where the, uh, the penetration depth uh, is based on the y-axis and the incident angle uh, of the beam on your sample is, is on the x-axis. You can see that uh, at uh, an 80 to 90 degrees, so basically perpendicular beam with respect to your sample, is optimal and nearly equivalent in terms of penetration depth. Uh, and you can also see that lowering the accelerating voltage actually uh, will minimize penetration depth. Uh, as well, if you go from 3 kV to 1 kV. So, and that is really important uh, for final thinning of a TEM sample. Um, so, 
This is an example here at the bottom shown for um, uh, gallium beam into nickel at an angle of 30, uh, 83 de degrees, where we lower from left to right the accelerating voltage. You can see that penetration depth um, significantly. Now I'd like to go into a little bit more specifics for what you need to do to get a good TEM sample out of it. So in general, there's uh, five processes that we use for that. So first of all, I already discussed SEM and FID imaging that we need, uh, that we need here. We need uh, a deposition process as well. Um, so we need to deposit a solid layer. So this is, this is a strip of platinum that uh, is uh, um, targeted onto the sample using a uh, gas injection system. I'll come to that uh, in a bit how that, that, that works. But we need to protect our region of interest. As you can see, that the uh, focus ion beam, even though it's, it's, it's uh, at low uh, voltages and currents, will always uh, damage uh, uh, the, the, the top surface. So the solution to that is to, to protect it using uh, a, a solid, solid material. Um, the other process uh, that we need is, of course, ion milling, sputtering, as I, as I mentioned, so for bulk removal and, and to thin the sample. Um, we also have a process that's called uh, in situ lift out. So Basically, we have a tungsten micro manipulator needle that you can also see in this, in this SEM image uh, that can be inserted in situ into the FIPSEM uh, and can be uh, using the, the, the same uh, GIS system can be welded onto the sample. And so this is uh, basically an SEM image of this process and this is the corresponding FIP image of that process uh, where the angle between the images is here 52 degrees. Um, the other process that we need is we need to attach this sample to something and that uh, we typically do to a TEM uh, half grid. So they come in various uh, sizes, shapes, and materials. Uh, the most common one is the uh, a copper one that's shown over here that uh, has, as you can see, four posts, A through D. There's a uh, Thin, that I call I posts, but also a little bit thicker ones that have the shape of an M, so I call those uh, M posts. And so you can mount a TEM sample in various ways, which I'll also show later. Um, but my most preferred method is to just put it on the side of one of these uh, posts. Now, what grid you select really depends on the material uh, that, 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 that you want to analyze in the TEM. So if you want to do um, EDS and you have copper, for example, you do not want a copper grid, you want to select uh, probably like molybdenum grids. Uh, so choose a grid that doesn't have the same um, material or doesn't overlap in EDS, uh, if you do EDS uh, analysis with, with, with any of your, of your uh, uh, composition of your, of your sample. Um, important to realize is that the, the ion beam is actually uh, has this, this Gaussian shape. So if you lower your current, you get a narrow, narrow beam distribution and basically uh, that leads to a higher spatial resolution. So it's better for accurate milling, but then it will also take longer time. So that's something to take into account. So higher currents means that the tails of this distribution will become larger. So effectively, you can mill further than that you indicated your, your pattern. So that's something to watch out for. But a higher current means uh, a lower spatial resolution, but it does mean that it, milling will uh, generally be faster. Um, now in the FIPSAM, the, the, these, these currents, they are controlled through aperture selections. So on the left here, you can see an aperture strip that has different size of, uh, of, of apertures. Um, this uh, blue uh, table here is basically the list that we have for our dual 4700 system, where you can see that uh, the largest aperture in this case is 19 nanoamps, but the smallest aperture gives a rise to a, a current that is uh, smaller than one uh, picoamp. And so 
for these different processes that I discussed in the previous slide, we use different uh, terms. And in general, for imaging deposition, depending on lift out, you use uh, something on the lower current side versus for rougher milling or just generally milling, you choose uh, higher, uh, higher currents. Um, now, uh, I, I promised I would talk a little bit more about the, the GIS uh, gas injection system, uh, uh, the, the deposition of the solid material. So this is basically done site specifically at a location to uh, a gas injection system needle that is inserted locally. Um, then uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the gas is basically heated up and ejected locally uh, underneath an area of your electron beam or ion beam uh, where it interacts uh, with, with the gas molecules uh, and uh, absorbed molecules will then decompose into volatile fragments that are carried away by the vacuum system, but uh, metallic deposits or metallic or um, uh, typically like a, something like a carbon deposit remains. So these are the precursor gases that are used. So uh, typically they're based on platinum, tungsten, uh, carbon, or a combination thereof, because uh, these gas sources really absorb easily onto the surface and decompose faster than they get spurred away. So, um, so you cannot use any, any gas. Um, so here is an, an actual image of a gas injection system very close, about 100 and 200 micrometers above the, uh, the site where we've uh, gotten a, a, a sample lifted out. So to go a little bit more over the process in detail. So um, the first step in the uh, TM lamella uh, process is you identify a region of interest. So in this case, we were interested in grain down boundaries um, uh, over here. What we did is, um, is deposit some, some platinum uh, using the electron beam first, as we know that gallium is, is destructive even for the, the top surface of, of, of the region of interest and can lead to things like implantation and other effects. Uh, so we deposit a small strip, um, in this case, of platinum using the GIS system. The second step is we tilt our stage 53 degrees. Uh, we deposit some more platinum using the ion beam. Um, as we now already have uh, protected our, our region of interest. The uh, following step would be uh, a bulk out. So here we really need to go to, to higher currents to, to get sputtering deeper into the sample and uh, you know, mill, uh, in this case, to, to trenches surrounding um, the, the, uh, the region where we deposited our platinum. Then we clean up uh, the edges at, at higher currents. Uh, um, we sputter much more material away, and you can see that there is some uh, redeposition. I will talk about that later, what that exactly is. But so uh, amorphous material that can also adhere to the sidewall, so we mill that away at Lower currents again, so that's a cleanup step. And he typically, um, we would leave our sample here at something like uh, one and a half micrometers thick, um, because we also need to cut it underneath. So if you leave it too thick, then it, it's very difficult for the ion beam to, to reach uh, uh, underneath. So this, this process is called a J cut, because this has a, a shape of a J where you basically know uh, three rectangles um, uh, so that there is one dangling site uh, left over. So I definitely recommend to cut your sample something like one and a half micron or, or thinner, um, one to one and a half micron. Um, the next process is to weld the uh, omniprobe, so the tungsten needle to our sample, uh, in this case, again, using uh, uh, a bit of platinum. Uh, and cut the other side loose at an increased uh, current, just as we did our, uh, our J-cut, basically similar parameters. And then we can drive the Omniprobe 
um, in X, Y, and Z. So we use the FIP image to drive up the omni port in Z, and at X, Y, uh, we use the SEN image to judge uh, where we're located with sample. Um, so this is uh, uh, just uh, imaging at, at lower currents again. Uh, we do not want to create more damage into our sample. Uh, and then we lift it out and uh, uh, and uh, approach uh, one of the posts on our our, uh, our copper grid in this case. Uh, and as I mentioned, I, I like to mount it on the on the side here as a as a flag. So we approach. Um, then uh, again, we uh, use the GIS system to deposit a little bit of platinum so to adhere the sample uh, at lower currents. Uh, then we, uh, we tilt our sample uh, perpendicular to the ion beam. In this case, it's 53 degrees for our 3700 system. Uh, we trim the lamella at, uh, at uh, somewhat milder, milder currents uh, initially. Uh, and uh, as a consecutive step, I milled out a uh, specific uh, window. And so for this, uh, uh, you really need to know how, at, at what condition, uh, how deep your, your, uh, your gallium beam penetrates into the sample. So that this requires some knowledge of your sample, some practice uh, experimentally. Um, then uh, as a next step, we actually go to lower currents and lower voltages as, as uh, uh, part of the, the, the thinning process. Uh, and we use a principle that's called over tilt. So as you can see here from the tilt angles, we tilt a little bit into our sample and that is needed because if we do not do that, we are basically head on with the ion beam and we move too much, remove too much of our protective layer. Uh, but if we tilt, too much, so if you create too much of an overtill, you might damage your lamella at, at the bottom side. So just the right amount uh, uh, is needed, and that is that can be material dependent. Uh, and uh, you can you can check there are certain recipes for certain materials with your uh, microscope uh, provider, for example. Um, now uh, this is for 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 this material I. Uh, did an overtill of one and a half degrees uh, at five kV and eighty picoamps. Um, then further, and then as a final step, I did a low kV uh, cleaning, as I illustrated before. Lower kVs, a little bit uh, uh, lower angles, uh, get, gives rise to less penetration depth of, of the, uh, the the beam into, into your sample, and then uh, eventually you can get. Uh, something that looks like this, where you can judge from this image uh, that there is uh, an electron transparent window that is approximately five by one micrometer. And uh, the lamella final thickness can also be uh, judged from the head on measurements. Uh, in this case, it's about 36 nanometers um, thick. So, can you infer from the FIPS and when a sample becomes electron transparent? And the answer is yes. So we can infer uh, from the grayscale if a sample, for example, is uh, electron transparent here. This is for silicon that is actually imaged at different accelerating voltages, so 10 kV, 5 kV, and 2 kV. And uh, silicon becomes electron transparent at, uh, at 10 kV, about uh, 350 nanometers. You can see here that uh, the grayscale is, is different with respect to the surrounding silicon that is left thicker. Uh, and so th this is this is generally good to know uh, if you, if you mill a certain material, so you can judge from the SEM image if your material is electron transparent or not. Oh, um, an interesting or um, important consideration is that heavy elements become electron tr transparent at smaller thicknesses. So if you have much lighter materials like uh, epoxy, for example, it becomes electron transparent at much larger thicknesses. Um, here is an example of 100 nanometers versus 40 nanometers thick lamella. So it is basically uh, mounted as a flag in two different regions uh, where we're milled. And in the 100 nanometer uh, image, we cannot see any uh, atomic structure. But uh, at 40 nanometers, we can see our, our, our atomic columns pretty nicely. Um, 
With this, I just would like to illustrate that we can create TM samples out of a very large range of materials from hard to soft. So this is a, a, a meteorite that is, is made of, of hard, basically hard rock. So extremely hard materials, it takes a long time to prepare, but it's possible to prepare in this uh, TM lamella with a gallium ion beam. Um, in the center, we have a, a hybrid material, uh, uh, tooth enamel, so the outer layer of uh, human teeth uh, that we did that uh, also contains organics. Uh, and on the right, uh, the, uh, a very soft material, which is basically pure carbon, so graphite, that we uh, were able to successfully create an excellent transparent sample out of. Um, also, TM samples can be prepared from very exotic morphologies as illustrated by these type of projects, these two projects. So the first one is uh, we have these, these crystal structures. Uh, this is a uh, hydroxyapatite, which is shown here by the, the chemical formula, uh, which we uh, created, uh, um, which we synthesized in the presence of magnesium. And it's known that magnesium can substitute for calcium 2 plus as well to a certain extent, and we wanted to know how much, so we created a TM sample out of that. We actually created two regions. Uh, um, region number one is, uh, is the thinnest region that we created, that we use for, for stem imaging. So this is the atomic structure. Um, this is a beam sensitive material, so we use cryogenic conditions to, to, to image this. And, but region two is, is left thicker, and so that uh, will generate more x-rays, so it was easier to do uh, uh, EDS analysis in the TEM, where we found out that there is uh, about 1.2 atomic percent magnesium indeed substituted in this in this crystal lattice. Another project uh, from a user over here is uh, is that of uh, these uh, unicellular organisms that live in our oceans uh, that are 100 micron of microns large. They have these uh, uh, spicules uh, that are made out of strontium sulfate mineral. Uh, supposedly a single crystal structure, but they have very intricate morphology at the end of the of these spicules, as you can see in this uh, ASEAN image over here. So uh, in order to create a TM lift out of that, we created um, a platinum pillar, so we kind of filled the material surrounding the, 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 the spicule, and um, uh, henceforth we were able to uh, lift out uh, the sample and create a, a TM sample. Um, this slide I incorporated to demonstrate we can also change orientation of our lamella. So in this case, we were interested in this multi-layer uh, uh, over here and the, specifically the defects between uh, various uh, layers. And the material, as you can see from the cross-section here, is, is buried. So these layers are buried um, like a micron or so deep uh, into the sample. So what we did is we uh, rotated the Omniprobe after lift out manually 180 degrees. Uh, and then uh, in this way, we were able to orient uh, the sample basically 90 degrees. So 180 degree rotation in your Omniprobe actually leads to a sample rotation of 90 degrees. And so we were able to uh, create a TM sample and study the, uh, the, the defects here. Um, Last part, I really would like to just talk about some common problems and artifacts, uh, and also importantly, how to tackle. So uh, I've talked about ion implantation, gallium ion implantation already. So uh, that can be mitigated, for example, through uh, the deposition of that, that solid capping layer. Um, and uh, um, also by um, uh, Putting the solid capping layer on with the electron beam prior to even imaging in the, uh, in the with the gallium beam. Uh, Redeposition is basically the process of uh, if you uh, mill in a certain region, the sputter material can deposit nearby. So that's demonstrated in this in these images over here. So if we go from left to right, we are increasing our dose double uh, when moving to the right in the images. Uh, and what we can see here is uh, if you know this, this rectangle, the roughness of the sidewalls uh, becomes, becomes much more if we increase our dose. So I've, I've indicated here in red the effective area that we're still milling, but in yellow, the, the sidewalls, uh, that, that, that the rough surface roughness uh, through uh, region position that gets larger and larger. So that 
that really um, is prevalent when you're milling deep and narrow features at, at, at higher and higher currents. And um, this process is, is depending on uh, the energy of the sputtered particles and, and how well they stick. Um, how can you mitigate that? Well, first of all, lowering the dose here, lowering iron currents is, is one strategy. Uh, changing the milling geometry, as I mentioned, like if you have deep narrow trenches, you will get this process more quickly than if you have like a perfect square, for example. Um, uh, and uh, another way to mitigate this is through uh, over tilting the stage just a bit. So basically changing the angle of interaction of your gallium beam sample. Um, curtaining uh, is basically uh, the appearance of these, these vertical streaks here in, in, in this uh, sample. So it's kind of reminiscent of this uh, classic theater curtain uh, um, that, that, that's displayed here. So that, that really is created by a spatial variation of the sputter rates um, because the ion beam can get deflected by tilted faces and then basically modif uh, modifying the dose locally. Uh, very prevalent in porous material. So th this material here has pores. Uh, so after pores, you typically get that. Uh, rough surfaces, so this is also a rough surface. But also things like composites of hard soft materials. So harder materials uh, basically uh, uh, mill very differently. And so they can create these vertical streaks onto the soft material. So one strategy there, for example, would be to uh, uh, orient the sample in such a way that your, your soft material is on the top surface. Um, so um, you can mitigated in, in various ways as one additional that I already just briefly addressed is uh, through putting on a thicker deposition layer, lowering your current. Uh, for TM sample preparation, you can uh, do backside milling, so mill the other side to mitigate that. Um, but you can also uh, uh, use a process called stage locking, so that um, actually more, um, uh, uh, modern FIBs have a, a, a stage that can do these processes automatically. I believe Tascan has uh, 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 a stage uh, that can rock, where, where basically you, you uh, change the orientation of, of your milling you, you, uh, in, a, in a random position. So in this case, it's, it's like 90 degrees and then maybe another 10 degrees. Uh, and then uh, you repeat the process, you uh, rotate back, uh, to your original position and then uh, mill, uh, mill again. Uh, so you're changing the orientation. Um, then uh, amorphization is another uh, effect. So uh, you can see here uh, the damage that is created in, in silicon um, for different accelerating voltages. Uh, as I basically addressed before, uh, at 30 kV, you have a, a damage layer, an amorphous silicon layer of about 20 nanometers, versus at 2 kV, you go to something like 3 nanometers. And so you can mitigate that to lowering the, the accelerating voltage on the edge. Uh, Lamella specific uh, artifacts, so bending is, for example, one. Uh, so if you prepare your sample, something like a uh, thin sheet of paper, basically. So just thin it uh, uh, for a large area. Uh, then uh, it may bend as, as is illustrated here. So uh, you can mitigate that through, again, lowering the current voltage, um, the beam dwell time, uh, or use a different uh, lamella geometry. In this case, we were mounting it as a flag and we created several windows uh, to, to get more rigidity in the surrounding area, areas. Or you can attach it uh, to a different part in the TEM grid. So this is uh, the M post, so a sample can be mounted in between here, which costs more time, but may help with lambda bounding. And you also need to weld it on securely uh, at two points. Um, last artifact is, is holes uh, in your TEM lamella. 
it, it's a very it can be very intricate with porous samples. So uh, the pores as uh, as you uh, do your TM sample thinning uh, uh, become uh, can become wider. Uh, and other artifacts can, can be prevalent after that, such as bending, curling, or even completely destroying the region of interest. Uh, an example here is that of, uh, of this was a, a, a mouse panel, so uh, the, uh, the outer layer of uh, a mouse tooth that has uh, crystallites that are oriented um, uh, in, in, in bundles. So there's different types of bundles of, of these crystallites that can be seen. But uh, this is a TM image prepared from, from that, that region. And you can see huge amount of porosity over here. I left this sample about a little bit thicker than 100 nanometers because after, if, if I went thinner than 100, this, this would just completely disintegrate. So sometimes leaving it a little bit thicker can be actually advantageous. So hereby I'm close to the end, so I, I want to just with some takeaway messages. So uh, besides showing that, you know, I'm just talking in general, that sample preparation is crucial to st stem characterization, that the FIPSAM is a great tool in the stem sample prep arsenal to site specifically prepare samples at various or, uh, orientations for uh, a wide range of materials. Um, example I didn't really address uh, is, for example, with respect to design of uh, protective layer. So uh, if I need to do uh, stem imaging, I typically put like a small carbon uh, layer uh, uh, on top of the crystalline sample to tune my run uh, uh, onto. And um, we also saw, for example, that electron transparency differs with different KV and material types. So it's, it's good to know your material properties and how to respond to gallium interaction. Uh, so. Uh, I hope you, I, I supplied you um, with uh, various strategies to tackle a problem and create a solution that you're trying to address in order to make a TMML uh, as well as to uh, uh, how to mitigate uh, potential issues. Um, and finally, TM lamella preparation is, is really not only science, but a form of art. And this, I think this sample uh, illustrates that as well. This is, um, uh, a uh, semiconductor sample that was lifted out of a different geometry, put onto uh, a, a MEMS device, uh, uh, was a Porter Chips MEMS device with contacts. Uh, and uh, so that can be used uh, in situ uh, TEM to bias your sample. Um, and so, uh, yeah, with that, I, I, I like to take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Uh, this is just a one little project that I I, uh, I did. So I deposited some platinum and milled at different depths into uh, our, our logo at, and at different accelerating voltages. It, it's either bright or dark appearing. Um, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention.